The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. On a day in early 1874, the Russian composer Modest Mussorgsky attended an exhibition of works by the recently deceased artist and architect Viktor Hartmann. For Mussorgsky, it was a poignant moment. He was at the height of his powers as a composer, having premiered his masterpiece, Boris Godunov, only a couple of months before, to the massive appreciation of the general audience, even though the critics had roasted him. But his dearest friend and biggest fan Hartman was not to attend this moment of triumph, as he had died in August the year before, quite suddenly and unexpectedly from an aneurysm. As Mussorgsky shuffled heavily from painting to painting, observing the breadth of his departed friend's imagination and audacity, the cruelty of life's circumstances was mixed with the sheer wonder of witnessing over 400 visual works. Certain personalities leapt out from the canvases, squabbling couples and haggling merchants at a street market, children frolicking in Paris gardens or modeling fantastical costumes for the ballet Trilby, then beneath Paris as two gentlemen and their guide almost disappear into the pointillistic gloom of its catacombs. Two very sympathetic portraits of East European Jews would have been well known to Mussorgsky already, as Hartmann had given them directly to him as a token of esteem and he had in turn contributed them to the exhibition. A few months later, in the middle of composing a suitably morbid song cycle, Mussorgsky's despair over the loss of his friend suddenly turned into white-hot inspiration. In the span of three short weeks, he turned the overwhelming experience of having attended Hartmann's posthumous exhibition into a musical tour de force for piano. Hartmann's evil gnome leapt over the piano keys, little French children gambled across them, and deep tolling chords heralded the language of the dead. Even Mussorgsky's own shuffling, rather oafish walk became a part of the musical fabric, in a prologue and intermezzos between several paintings, and then working its way into the triumphant ending as an apotheosis of Hartmann's most extravagant notion, an enormous city gate for Kiev shaped like the headgear of a bogatyr, a legendary Russian warrior. The work that Mussorgsky composed was Pictures at an Exhibition, and over the next few months on Patreon and here on YouTube, we're going to be studying this work in its most well-known epic orchestration by Maurice Ravel. But let's take a quick look at the original piano version first, so we can grasp some of the context of Mussorgsky's extraordinary achievement. In fact, the version that's most commonly played is the one edited by Rimsky-Korsakov after Mussorgsky's death. For despite Mussorgsky's fans and followers immediately loving his newly composed masterpiece, his more educated composer friends felt that he'd gone too far. The easily intimidated Mussorgsky thereupon shelved the work, and it wasn't to be published until after he died in the following decade. Though Western concert music tends to think of pictures at an exhibition mainly as an orchestral showpiece, Russian pianists consider it to be fundamental repertoire, especially the finale. One of the first things I notice about the score as a recitalist is the full-fingeredness of Mussorgsky's piano writing. Octaves and four-part chords abound from the very beginning of the score. The pianist has to physically commit to this kind of approach, especially in louder passages. There's also a wonderful fluidity of phrasing, sometimes for right-hand melodies, other times for fierce scoring in octaves.
Mussorgsky excels at heavy, thick textures, even to the point of gentle self-mockery as we see in the promenade intros. And it's easy to forget that he could be just as handy with nimble, light-fingered passages. There's a perception of Mussorgsky as a kind of bumbling savant, who was the most inspired but least skilled of the Mighty Five. And there's some truth behind this rather savage stereotype. But that obscures the fact that he was an excellent pianist in his own right, usually capable of playing anything he composed. It takes a very precise touch to pull off the more delicate passages. We'll be looking at the piano score in detail alongside Ravel's version in this series, and examining how the source material relates to Ravel's task of orchestration. The most important takeaway, though, is how Mussorgsky is constantly reaching for greater colors and context than a solo piano can provide. Of course, that can make for an amazing piano work, but it also opens the door for us orchestrators when a work is built for a bigger sound in the first place. There's a misperception out there that Rimsky-Korsakov orchestrated pictures at an exhibition. In fact, he started to sketch out some preliminary ideas, but then found out that his star pupil of the 1880s, the conductor and composer Mikhail Tushmalov, was deep into his own orchestration of the same work. Probably not wanting to rock the boat, and being busy enough already with other projects, the master set aside his own plans, but conducted the premiere and added his own editing to Tushmalov's score. This was the first orchestration of pictures, coming around a dozen years after its creation. It's incomplete, missing several movements or paintings, but it's solid work and must have made Rimsky-Korsakov proud as a teacher. Tushmalov's score is uploaded to IMSLP if you want to compare it to Ravel's version, and we'll take a closer look at it as well in our next video when we study the opening promenade. But it was only the first of many attempts to arrange and orchestrate pictures at an exhibition. The British conductor Henry Wood was the next to take up the task, and he produced another partial version in 1915 that was greatly admired by orchestration teacher Gordon Jacob. Seven years later, the Slovenian violinist Leo Funtek orchestrated the first complete version, but this was almost eclipsed by circumstances. Serge Kuzovitsky, one of the greatest conductors of all time, commissioned a version of pictures at an exhibition from Ravel, and that orchestration is deservedly the standard version that's been performed and recorded through the following century. This was a particularly happy time for Ravel. He had recently moved into his house, Le Belvedere, and was pursuing a more straightforward, less exaggerated aesthetic than that of his early compositions. But he was still fascinated with artifice, musical effects, and cultural homages. In tackling Mussorgsky's pictures, Ravel would put on the orchestral clothing of Rimsky-Korsakov and yet make his own personal improvements, 
He'd also inject some genuine French soul into those musical depictions of Paris street life. You can see this straightforwardness in Ravel's scoring. Gone are Daphnis and Chloe's persistent divisi strings, quadruple winds and trumpets, and offstage choir. Not that Ravel would have wanted them anyway, but this is a work intended to be toured extensively by Kusevitsky to many different orchestras across the world. Ravel calls for mostly standard orchestral numbers. Triple winds with all the first level auxiliaries, two flutes plus piccolo, two oboes plus English horn, two clarinets plus bass clarinet, and two bassoons plus contrabassoon. The exception is not too big of an ask. A solo alto saxophone during the movement Il Vecchio Castello. This is usually assigned to a dedicated player who plays nothing else throughout the course of the entire suite, since all three clarinetists and both bassoonists are engaged as well for that movement. However, it's not unheard of for the contrabassoonist or perhaps even the second oboist to cover this part with a smaller orchestra from time to time. Brass are also a very standard 4-3-3-1, a quartet of horns, triple trumpets and trombones, and tuba. Third trombone may well be played as bass trombone for sheer solidity and better blending with its partner the tuba, though there's nothing inherently impossible for a standard trombone, especially with an F trigger. Even without an enormous brass section, Ravel still gets a big beautiful sound whenever he needs it. The percussion section is also composed of fairly standard components, with one or two special instruments. Timpani, glockenspiel, tubular bells, triangle, tam-tam, cymbal, snare drum, bass drum, and xylophone are all par for the course in any percussionist's battery. While a rattle and a whip would be a little out of the ordinary for the 1920s, though no problem to find in a pinch if a small orchestra didn't have them already. which just leaves celesta, two harps, and strings. Though the scoring does get enormous from time to time, there's no need to bulk up the string section as with works like The Planets or The Rite of Spring. Ravel has already done a great deal of balancing already in the score, and the more standard complement of winds and brass are arranged in ways that tend to reinforce the strings rather than swamp them. Even limiting oneself to a standard 3-3-3-3, 4-3-3-1, percussion, harps, and strings orchestra presents enormous possibilities of sound and texture for a master orchestrator. But Ravel takes a similar approach to Holst's planets. Each movement and introduction features its own orchestra, its own specific tailor-made groups of instruments from within the greater ensemble. Huge tutti movements are actually relatively few. More typical are movements orchestrated to highlight a certain color or character, such as the intense reeds, horns, and tenuto strings of Samuel Goldenberg and Schmoyle.
In a very real sense, the history of pictures at an exhibition as a widely accepted concert work starts with Ravel's orchestration. Kusevitsky toured it across the globe and made it into an instant hit. But there was a catch. As the man who paid for the orchestration, he retained sole rights to publish and perform the work as he saw fit for several years. This resulted in other arrangements quickly following, largely at the request of other conductors and publishers wanting to get in on the act. Mussorgsky's publisher Bessel commissioned a version from Ravel's student Leonardi, which was premiered by Walter Damrosch with the New York Symphony. Then Eugene Ormandy commissioned a version from the Philadelphia Orchestra's staff arranger Lucien Cayet for his personal use. Stokowski was next, with a typically over-the-top reinterpretation of the music in which many passages were recomposed. And since then, Pictures at an Exhibition has been regularly reorchestrated over the decades, until there are around 30 different whole or partial versions for orchestra, not to mention 8 for concert band, and over 50 arrangements for other instruments. But we'll be studying Ravel's version, alongside the Rimsky-Korsakov Piano Edition, which Ravel used as a source for his orchestration. For this series of orchestration analyses, it's my honor to have been granted permission by the Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra and their conductor Alfonso Scarano to use their excellent performance which was uploaded to YouTube in 2016. There are so many things which are more easily explained by showing you what's happening during a live performance, and this video will be enormously helpful. This series will launch publicly on YouTube in March of 2019, but if you can't wait, please join us now on Patreon, where the first video lecture on the opening promenade has already been released, with further videos to follow over there every 10 to 15 days. But however you view it, welcome to a new Orchestration Online score analysis series.